Normal, ordinary people in this country have the idea that science is embodied by experts. And if you have a degree in something, you're an expert. And if somebody else has a degree in science, he's an expert. So if two experts disagree, first of all, you don't know what to think. But you probably think that there isn't very much good science going on there because experts disagree. Well, let's talk about experts, first of all. Just because someone has a scientific degree or a degree in anything doesn't mean he's an expert. A, he's not an expert in that particular field, perhaps. B, he might not be an expert on a particular subject. C, what he knows may be out of date. It may be colored by other kinds of preconceptions or training he's had. And he doesn't really know the whole picture of things. There are lots of different kinds of experts. And that's why we don't embody science in experts. The concept of experts is an authoritarian concept. Priests, for example, are authority figures. The Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra, is held by Catholics to be infallible. Well, in science, nobody's infallible. Not Einstein, not Feynman, not Newton, not Darwin, not anyone. So it's not embodied in the people. It's embodied in the methods and how you do things and in the community of science that's reflected by all the things that we do and we publish. Now let's talk about what it means to do science. Just hanging out in a lab is not doing science. Doing science is testing hypotheses, gathering evidence, subjecting it to new kinds of analyses and synthesis, and most importantly, communicating those results in a particular way. This particular way is called peer review. Now it's very important for people who want to understand what science is to understand the concept of peer review and why, for example, just because you publish a book that you say is about science doesn't mean that that book is important, right, or even any science at all. Why is this? Because the concept of peer review is a funny process. When you get an idea, you gather some evidence, you test your hypothesis, you get enough together that you're ready to, to kind of put it out to people to publish it. You send it to a scientific journal editor. You don't send it to Norton Books. You don't send it to, 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 to uh, 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 Scribner or Knopf or, or you know, any of the uh, major publishing houses. You send it to a scientific journal because the journal editors will take your manuscript. And if they think you look like you know what you're doing to start with, they will send it out for peer review. What this means is they send this anonymously to people you don't know and you don't choose. And I mean, you may know them, but you don't know who they are. And you get almost always an anonymous peer review. The peer reviewer doesn't have to remain anonymous, but you know, mostly they do. And that peer reviewer looks at your manuscript, and he looks at what you've done and what you're proposing, and he says, OK, here's a proposal. Now, now, did this person test this in the right way? Is this an accepted method? Did he use the accepted standards of evidence? Did he gather enough evidence? Was it the right kind? Did he use enough, good enough statistics if he had to do a statistical test of his data? Did he do, um, were his conclusions reasonable based on what he had? Did he go beyond? Did he speculate too much? Is this productive of new ideas and hypotheses? Or is it completely unconstrained? And the reviewers will suggest perhaps several minor changes, maybe major changes, or maybe they think you're off your nut and you missed some really major things here, and you better go back from the drawing board and start again. because you've. And they will tell you exactly what they think you did wrong. Now, that's just their view. But the editor will take the view of each of these reviewers, which are independent, and he'll decide what you have to do with your manuscript, send it back to you, and then you, you get the decision and you go from there. Now, now, by no means do scientific journals publish everything they get. Some journals are much more discriminant than others. And that's why when, you, when the scientific community looks to what the best results are, you look for the most strongly peer-reviewed journals. Some journals accept 90% of what they get. It's you know, pretty much the journeyman work of the field that's, that's just fine and you know, not controversial and generally turned in by important people. It could be new species descriptions or new descriptions of fossils, sort of the, the building blocks of the field, the very you know, small things that we all do as part of, as part of our, our, our professions. But the really big ideas, the, 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 the groundbreaking stuff, the challenging stuff, the revolutionary stuff, generally goes to journals that reject you know, up to 90% or more of the submissions that people send them. Because these are the top journals, the most visible ones, the most highly esteemed ones that everyone wants to publish in. 
And that's how peer review works. Now, it doesn't mean that it's because something is peer reviewed that it's right. I mean, things in science are destined to be overturned or modified by further work. But at least this has been seen by experts. And if the editor has done a good job and the reviewers have been conscientious, then a lot of the problems that could be inherent in a piece will be filtered out. Uh, having said that, generally speaking, we allow a certain amount of latitude for um, scientists to speculate, to explore, to think about what could happen next. But the speculations have to be constrained by what is testable, as we talked about before. It's, it's science comes down to testability, and that's where we are. Now, when you come to talk about the intelligent design proponents, aren't these guys experts? Actually, some of them are experts. Almost none of them are scientists. But wait, you say, some have science degrees. Well, just because you have a science degree doesn't mean you're a scientist. If you're not testing hypotheses and doing research and publishing it, you are not a scientist. You may have a science degree, but you are not a scientist. Well, but aren't they experts in their field? Didn't they learn a lot? Weren't they trained? Well, actually, none of these people was trained in any of the fields that are related to what we're talking about. None of them is an evolutionary biologist, a zoologist, a botanist, uh, uh, a population biologist, a paleontologist, a macroevolutionary biologist, evolutionary theorist, a population geneticist. None of the fields that have to do with evolution are covered by any of the intelligent design proponents. That ought to send up a flag right away. Now, does that mean that, that a scientist that comes from another field can't say something intelligent? Sure they can. And it doesn't mean they have two strikes against them. But they've got to follow the rules everybody else follows. And that means that they've got to submit what they say to peer review. It's got to be reviewed by other people. They've got to take their lumps, and they've got to look at this stuff and revise it. If it gets rejected, they've got to say, well, you know, I guess the scientific community isn't buying this. But they haven't done a single thing in that regard. There hasn't been a single scientific publication that has anything to do with intelligent design. The intelligent design supporters maintain, but we have all these peer-reviewed publications and books. Actually, none of those peer-reviewed publications were peer-reviewed by scientists in the field, as far as we can tell. We have no evidence of this at all. William Dembski is not even a scientist. He's called a scientist. He signed the petition that says, 100 scientists who doubt Darwin. He's not a scientist. He has degrees in math. He has degrees in theology. This isn't a scientist. Michael Behe is a biochemist. Maybe he does perfectly fine work when he's in his biochemistry lab. But he doesn't have any credentials in evolution. None of these people has ever come to a scientific meeting in evolution and presented their work. They don't even present scientific stuff on intelligent design in any conferences that are scientific. They don't want to. So they're avoiding all the peer review that's going on here. They say, but we've published with Cambridge University Press. We've published with Michigan State Press. Well. Yeah, but university presses are not journal editors. I'm on the board of university press here in California. I've worked with scientific publishers all over the world for 25 years. And I know what their review process is like. They are not like journals. They're not as rigorous. In some cases, they're not even the field. Darwin Design and Public Education is a book by intelligent design proponents that is about, it's about education. It is not about science. There isn't science in that book. It is not peer-reviewed by scientists. William Dembski has provided no evidence that any of his books were reviewed by scientists. Darwin's black box, there is no evidence it was reviewed by evolutionary biologists or people who would have known about it. We have no evidence of this peer review. And without this kind of evidence, how these people can say that their stuff is peer-reviewed? Well, some kind of peer, maybe, but maybe it was an education specialist. Maybe it was a social scientist. Maybe it was a mathematician. But those people don't get to tell us what science is.